All right, it is six o'clock on September 9th, 2022, and I am calling to order this meeting of the City of Placerville Planning Commission. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Mr. Rivas, could you please call roll? Vice Chair Friend is absent. Uh, Chair Gopper? Here. Commissioner Keeney? Here. Commissioner Lepper? Here. Commissioner List? Here. All right, we have no closed session report tonight, so we will move on to adoption of the agenda. Motion to adopt. Plus six. All right, I have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Uh, so we have adopted our agenda. Moving on to our consent calendar. The item on the consent calendar tonight is to approve the minutes of the regular Planning Commission meeting of July 19th, 2022. And I will note that there are no members of the public present to make public comment. Anybody like to make a motion? Uh, motion to adopt the meeting minutes from the July 19th, 2022 meeting. Um, I'll second. <laughs> so we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, so we have three yes and one abstention by Commissioner List. We're going to move on to... Uh, items of interest to the public, public comment, non-agenda items. Uh, again, we have no members of the public present tonight to make public comment. So we will be moving on to item number eight, written communications, non-agenda items. Um, Mr. Rivas, have we received any written communications? We have no written communications, Chair. Okay. So then we are going to move on to presentations and educational workshop sessions. So tonight we do have a educational workshop session. Uh, presentation. It is a video presentation, Community of Choices, and I will, it looks like this is uh, Mr. Rivas's item. Yes, thank you, um, uh, members of the Planning Commission. Basically, this is a video that we tend to show every, I would say, every four to five years. Um, in fact, I think when I was on the Commission, I saw this uh, movie. It was provided by the then council member, um, uh, Kathy Lishman and it's fairly informative it's a half hour and I think it just it's sort of a reminder of some of the aesthetics that I think it's really important not to um, overlook when we're doing our site plan reviews so hopefully some of you that have not seen it will find it informative uh, I think Commissioner List you, you may have seen this before um, I don't know if Commissioner Keeney has seen this one before. Probably not. So we were hoping to capture him. Now, I know um, Mr. Fran, he, he's probably seen it four or five times <laughs> 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 for the length of time he's been on the commission. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, start start the show. faster than ever. 
At the same time we've been saving some landmarks, we've been losing the landscape that gives these landmarks their larger sense of meaning. And while we've been cleaning up air and water pollution, we've been losing our sense of place. I mean, if you were suddenly dropped along a road outside of almost any American city, you wouldn't have the slightest idea where you were because it all looks exactly the same. You wouldn't know if you were in Albany or Allentown, Providence or Pittsburgh, Charlotte or Cincinnati. As the famous Western author Wallace Stegner once wrote, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. All of us have a fundamental need for a sense of orientation, a sense of roots, a sense of place. What is sense of place? First, it's what makes your hometown different from my hometown. Second, and perhaps more important, it's what makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. In many parts of America, we are suffering the social consequences of living in places that simply aren't worth caring about. For all the improvements we've made in cleaning the air and water, building roads and schools, faster computers, many people still ask, is this all there is? Can't our communities be more distinctive, more livable, more beautiful? A few years ago, Victoria Tashinkle, the former Secretary of Natural Resources for the state of Florida said, I think we can probably take care of pollution-related problems in Florida, but even if we do, I'm not sure this is going to be a very nice place to live because of the density of population and the lack of sense of community. Florida could end up as just one convenience store after another. Her words are true for cities and towns all over America. Growth is both certain and desirable, but the destruction of community character and natural resources that too often accompanies growth is not inevitable. Progress does not demand degraded surroundings. Communities can grow without destroying the things that people love. The real questions are not whether your town will grow, because it will, or whether it will change, because it will. The real questions are how. How will it change, and how will it grow? As our communities expand, we need to plan for growth by carefully planning and managing the patterns of development. To accomplish this, communities must consider three things. Where do you put development? How do you arrange it? And what does it look like? Here are some examples of what is meant by patterns of development. This is the cornfield at Antietam, Maryland, the site of the bloodiest day in the history of the United States. During the Civil War, 23,000 Americans fell here on a September afternoon in 1862. If you visit this place, you can almost visualize the waves of infantry moving across the field, sense the urgency and how history was changed there that day. Yet the National Trust for Historic Preservation once listed this site as one of the nation's 10 most endangered historic places. It's off the list today, thanks to the hard work of many people, but what was it in danger of? If you travel 100 miles south to Spotsylvania County, Virginia, you'll find the site of the South's greatest victory in the Civil War, the Battle of Chancellorsville. This is the Salem Church that was a key feature during the fighting, a makeshift Confederate fortress. After the battle, it served as a hospital for the wounded of both sides. Lovingly restored, the church is not only a national historic landmark, but a classic example of saving a structure and losing a place. This is why the battlefield at Antietam was in danger. So what's wrong with this picture? There are better places in America to put a shopping center than in the middle of our historic and hollowed grounds. The point is, some places are better for development than others. The first principle of better development is planning where you should and should not develop. Every community needs a blueprint for how it wants to grow. Two tools used for this are a conservation plan and an economic development plan. These allow us to have both conservation and development and to help communities preserve their identities. But part of the problem is how we think about conservation and development. This is a view of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and this a town just outside the park. Sometimes we think there are only two choices, either preserve the land or develop all of it. Either create a park with nobody living in it or allow ugly, environmentally insensitive development right next door, even though the landscape there may be just as outstanding. But these aren't the only choices we have. We have a third choice. We can have growth and development that respects and enhances the character of our communities. 
and that complements the quality of our landscape. This concept has different names, sustainable development, smart growth, but it's really about development that's good for the environment, good for business, and good for the community. Let's consider a few examples, starting with something very simple, residential street design. If you're a developer, the most expensive part of the development process is building the streets. So let's look at this subdivision in Wisconsin, where the street is 24 feet across from curb to curb. In this Virginia subdivision, on the other hand, the street is 40 feet across. On which street would you rather live? On which street do you think the houses are more affordable? Which street is better for the environment? And which street is safer for children? First, compare the cost of the houses. If you add 16 feet of pavement to the width of the street, you increase the cost of the houses along that street by thousands of dollars. So more pavement means less affordable housing. More pavement also means more soil erosion, more sedimentation, and more water pollution going into our rivers and streams. And as far as safety is concerned, the 24-foot wide street is four times safer than the 40-foot wide street. Why? Because the wider the streets are, the faster the cars go. So being more flexible on residential street standards is good for business, good for the environment, and good for the community. Now think about trees. Here are two streets with identical houses on each. Which street do you think has higher property values? Which street has lower utility bills? And on which street would you rather live? Studies show that developed lots with trees sell for an average of 20 to 25 percent more than similar sized lots without trees. The temperature here on a hot summer day can be six degrees higher than the temperature here on that same day. As it turns out, dollars do grow on trees. In short, trees are good for business, good for the environment, and good for the community. What about shopping centers? Would you prefer to shop in a center heavily landscaped with trees and bushes, or would you prefer to shop here? Well, look at what happened in Baldwin County, the southernmost county in Alabama on the shore of the Mobile Bay. Baldwin County was once a very hard place to get to until Interstate 10 was built. In a short time, investors started buying up land along other highways, cutting down the live oak trees and replacing them with strip malls. But many of the residents didn't like what was happening to their trees. So they proposed the first law in the state to preserve large trees, specifically in the parking lots of commercial buildings. Those who objected to this regulation said things like, nobody will go to the grocery store if there's a tree in front of it. So the county conducted a public opinion poll and asked their citizens if they would prefer to shop at a center heavily landscaped with trees and bushes or one without such landscaping. What happened? By a wide margin, people said they preferred trees to asphalt, and they passed that regulation, the first one in Alabama's history. This was the beginning of Baldwin County thinking about the relationship between community character and economic development. Now let's consider the gateway to a community, its front door. Just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important, a bad one hard to change. So would you rather visit Franklin, Tennessee or Midfield, Alabama? Which one looks like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks like a place you would rather spend time and money in? Every day, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to vacation, and where to retire based on what our communities look like. The image of your community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. Think about visiting a new town or city, for instance. The more one community looks like every place else in America, the less reason there is to visit. On the other hand, the more a community does to enhance and preserve what makes it unique, the more reason there is to go there. That's because tourism is about seeking out those places in the world that are different, unusual, and unique. If every place was just like every place else, there'd be no reason to go any place. That's why the image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. Do you think tourists would rather see scenic views that look like this, or scenic views that look like this? As the Urban Land Institute once noted, housing, hotels, and offices with scenic views always command premium prices. The better the view, the higher the price. 
Now think about where you live. Before World War II, America had a model for development that worked for over 300 years. We called it a town. But after World War II, people decided to rearrange things. While we still have buildings, we now throw shopping centers over here and we put schools over there and put our houses over here. The result, we have to drive everywhere for everything. Recently though, a national survey showed most people would prefer to shop in a town center if they had a choice. As a result, we're actually building town centers again for the first time in 50 years. An example is Cascade Village in Loudoun County, Virginia. This would have been a strip shopping center just five or six years ago. As another example, this is Barnes & Noble Super Bookstore located on a busy highway just outside of Washington, D.C. Notice the big parking lot in front. It's similar to what you'd see in strip shopping centers all over America. On the other hand, this is Barnes & Noble store located in downtown Bethesda, Maryland. It's built right on the sidewalk. And while there's parking in the neighborhood, there's no parking lot directly in front of the building. So which one do you think makes more money? The one with the big parking lot in front or this one? Surprising to many, the downtown store makes 15% more per square foot than the one on the strip. And the reasons? Well, think about how you get to these two stores. The only way to get to the one on the strip is to drive. But there are more ways to get to the other store. You can walk because it's located in a neighborhood. Or you could ride your bike. Or take the subway. Or you could drive. And when you do get here, you'll find yourself in a real neighborhood where people hang out, walk around, and window shop. How many people do you know who go to strip shopping centers to hang out? In short, merchants and town centers are more successful because people spend more time on Main Street. In fact, the idea of a Main Street is the single hottest retailing concept in America today, a vision we abandoned 50 years ago. People are still drawn to these main streets because they're natural gathering places where you can enjoy a cup of coffee, read a magazine, meet your friends, or window shop. In addition, many communities are realizing why it's important to identify and preserve their historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes. Because they physically link us to our past, tell us who we are and where we came from. Preserving historic buildings is good for the heart and soul of a community, but it's also good for the pocketbook of a community. Let's look at a small example. This used to be the fire station in a small Midwestern town. When it became obsolete as a fire station, it was turned into a pizza parlor, but sales were low. So the owner of the restaurant restored the appearance of the building, physically linking his customers to the roots in the past. What else happened? Within the first year, pizza sales went up by 75%, showing how preservation can be enormously good for the bottom line. Or consider some larger examples, such as the Riverwalk in San Antonio, Texas. This is one of the nation's leading tourist attractions and the basis of the city's billion dollar tourism industry. What most visitors don't know, however, is that at one point the city's thought so little of this small river, they tried to put it underground into a culvert. In Seattle, Pike Place Market is the epitome of the city's working waterfront. Today, it is the single leading destination in Washington visited by 11 million people a year. Yet less than 30 years ago, the city seriously suggested demolishing the Pike Place Market to create a parking lot in its place. You can have all the parking in the world, but if you have nothing to do, then why would you want to go there? And in Florida, you'll find the Art Deco Historic District in South Miami Beach. It's the largest collection of Art Deco buildings in the United States. Once again, all were scheduled for demolition. Yet today, people come from all over the world to visit this place. While most people are in favor of preserving the best of their past, they also need to think about what's being built today that will be worth preserving tomorrow. In other words, what buildings will you and your children fight to save 50 years from now? This is an important question because 80% of everything ever built in America has been constructed since the end of World War II. And as Winston Churchill once said, we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. Meaning the physical character of our communities affects our sense of community. But it's hard to have a sense of community in a parking lot. So how can we get new buildings to enhance the character of our communities? Does every franchise and chain store in America have to look exactly alike? Of course not. New buildings can be designed to fit in with the character of a community and can complement the quality of the surrounding landscape. Yes, 
That's a new McDonald's. It's in a house that was built in 1873 in the small town of New Hyde Park, New York. Prospective brides even come here to pose for their bridal photographs. Or consider this McDonald's in Stowe, Vermont. Why does it look like a typical New England style building? Well, because it's in New England. We live in a nation of highly varied history, climate, culture, and terrain. So why shouldn't the buildings in one part of America look different from buildings in another part? Shouldn't buildings in New England look different from buildings in the Southwest? The Southwest different from the Southeast? The Southeast different from the Midwest? Shouldn't buildings in a small town like Lake Forest, Illinois, be different from buildings in a big city like St. Louis, Missouri? Yes, that's also McDonald's at the foot of the famous Gateway Arch. It was built by a smart developer who realized that when fast food was no longer the novelty, design could be. He realized that our image of St. Louis is painted by its past. Images of the Mississippi River, Mark Twain, and riverboats, thus a McDonald's on a riverboat. The point is, if communities accept off-the-shelf corporate cookie-cutter architecture, they'll get it 100% of the time. On the other hand, if they insist on something better, something that fits with their community, they'll get that 100% of the time. Do national franchises and chain stores like to do this? No, not particularly, but they'll do whatever they have to do to be in an economically profitable location. For instance, this is the McDonald's in Freeport, Maine. The company bought this house in the 1970s with the intention of tearing it down and putting up a typical suburban-style McDonald's. But the town said, no, we want you to restore that house. McDonald's sued the town and lost. Now the company promotes this restaurant as an example of their good community stewardship. But they'll only do this when cities and towns are wise enough to say, first, we want a building that looks like it belongs in our community, and not just any place USA. Of course, the idea of community pride in place can apply to more than just buildings. Let's think about tourism again, with this ad out of an airline magazine. It says a chain of hotels should reflect the city they are located in and not each other. Here's a chain motel in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania home to the country's largest Amish population. When visitors arrive, they find busy commercial strips with look-alike motels instead of what they imagine the countryside would be. Rolling green hills, white farmhouses with red barns, small old-fashioned town centers. Elkhart County, Indiana, on the other hand, is also home to a large Amish population. A few years ago, they sent a delegation to Lancaster for ideas on how to attract tourists. They came back with two big ideas. First, establish a land trust to preserve open land. Second, develop design guidelines for new tourism support facilities, giving developers a strong suggestion of what ought to be done. The result? This is one of Elkhart's new chain motels. As you can see, they learned from Lancaster's mistakes. Here's an off-the-shelf 7-Eleven, compared to this new 7-Eleven. Or consider gas stations. The canopy of this one looks like a spacecraft. True, canopies prevent rain from reaching the customer, but they come in all shapes and styles. Here's one in Asheville, North Carolina that fits right in with the character of the community. Or how about this one? This new gas station is located in Waitsfield, a small town in Vermont. Notice how it looks like a country store. That's because it's in the country. How about chain drugstores like Rite Aid, CVS, Eckert's, Brooks? Here's a typical off-the-shelf Rite Aid. But this new one, located in Camden, Maine, was designed to look like a typical New England store because, once again, it's in New England. Notice how this Rite Aid in Washington, D.C. blends in with its neighbors. Or this one in Lake Placid, New York, with stone on the bottom, articulated roof line, and wood siding. Such designs are common in the Adirondacks. And what about the big box retailers like a Kmart or Walmart? Here's a typical Kmart. This on one hand is the Kmart in Jackson, Wyoming. This is a community trying to preserve its western heritage. So this Kmart with clock towers on each end, articulated roof lines, and a wooden front looks like it belongs. Sometimes people say, it's too late for our community. We already have too much clutter. Actually, it's never too late. Community character deteriorates slowly over time, but it can get better in small steps. For instance, this used to be a McDonald's in Asheville, North Carolina. Now there's a new McDonald's built on the side of the old one. This is a city that's decided that community character is important, so they're improving it, one building at a time. 
your community can get better too. One street, one building, and one development at a time. The famous oceanographer Jacques Cousteau used to say, people will save what they love. But how can we create the sense of love and caring for our communities? One way is through education and interpretation. Every community has a story to describe these traditions through historic markers, interpretive displays, and public art. For example, this is the Chisholm Trail mural in Fort Worth, Texas, which tells the story of how cattle drives were so important at the founding of Fort Worth. And this is the family album of Tacoma Park, Maryland. Every one of these pictures is important to that town's history. Once, Spokane, Washington, once manufactured the famous radio flyer wagons. What do they have there now? This piece of playground equipment, a piece of public art that physically connects people to their city's past. Or how about Clanton, Alabama, the state's peach capital, where they use their water tower to create a sense of place and tell a story about their town. Signs tell us much about the character of a community too. Outdoor signs are important because they give us direction and needed information. A business sign can be colorful, decorative, even distinguished. All too often, however, signs are oversized, poorly planned, and badly located. They're also too numerous. So what's wrong with this picture? Three things. It's ugly, it's expensive, and it doesn't work. Signs project the image of a community faster than almost anything else. These are before and after pictures of the same place. Think about the images the signs project. Do you want the image of your community to be classy or trashy, tacky or plain, special or ordinary, ugly or beautiful? When you look at the shopping center in Highlands, North Carolina, does it make you want to live there? When you see the sign in this other town, do you feel like you'd like to vacation here? Image is fundamentally important to the economic well-being of our communities. This is obviously a community that didn't pay attention to its image. On the other hand, communities that get more investment, more business, and more visitors pay attention to their appearance. Another aspect of signs is effectiveness. Imagine one store owner getting a big sign, then a competitor getting a bigger sign, then a third person getting an even bigger sign. Before you know it, you'd be advertising to airplanes instead of people. A cluttered commercial strip with huge signs, flags, and banners like this is ineffective because they prevent you from finding what you're looking for. It's almost impossible to absorb the overload of information on a cluttered commercial strip like this. But when you turn down the volume, every voice becomes distinct. In short, businesses do a better job of selling because people can see what they're looking for. But what exactly makes one community successful and another unsuccessful? Successful communities are good places to live, work, and invest because they do a few simple things. They make an inventory of their assets and create a vision for the future. They build all their plans, whether it's a tourism plan, an economic development plan, or a land use plan, around their assets. They use education, incentives, and voluntary initiatives, not just regulations. They pick and choose among developments, realizing not all development is created equal. They cooperate with resource managers for mutual benefit. They consider what a community looks like. They have a quality of life lobby. Let's look at these ideas in more detail. Successful communities look at what they have to offer and build their plans around their assets. Sometimes assets are obvious, such as those found in Boulder, Colorado, or Annapolis, Maryland, which has an obvious architectural legacy and a beautiful harbor. But sometimes these assets are not so obvious. Lowell, Massachusetts is an example. It was an industrial town of worn out and abandoned mill buildings that used its architectural heritage to its advantage, creatively reusing the mill buildings for commercial space, museums, and housing. Successful communities use education, incentives, and voluntary initiatives, not just regulation. The town of Pella, Iowa, for instance, gives new developers a handbook about why the architectural character of that town is important. They do this because they want new franchises, chain stores, and big box retailers to fit in. Successful communities also consider what they look like. The cover of the Vermont State Tourist brochure boasts that there are no billboards in the state. Why? Vermont is one of the five heavily tourism-dependent states that have removed all their billboards because they found it is one of the most important things they can do to strengthen the tourism industry. Petersburg, Virginia, on the other hand, could have been the Williamsburg of the Civil War, but it's not 
because they didn't pay any attention to what they look like. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania is another community that thinks aesthetics is important. Since there were no utility wires running through the battlefield in 1863, the community worked to bury five miles of utility wires through that battlefield, restoring its sense of place. So what do you want your community to look like in 20 years? If you don't ask that question, it'll end up looking like any place USA. You see, there are really only two kinds of change in America, unplanned change or planned change. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. Finally, let's think about the social and psychological value of the ideas presented today. Why is it that people feel a sense of loss, like losing a loved one or a friend when a grove of trees is cut down, an historic building demolished, or a scenic view obliterated? It's not because we can't plant new trees or build new buildings. It's because our sense of identity is tied in a very profound way to special buildings, places, and views. Each has a rich symbolic importance, which contributes to our sense of identity and well-being. In fact, long ago, an ancient Roman statesman said, cities should preserve the visible symbols of their identity to give their citizens a sense of security in a changing world. 2,000 years later, anthropologist Margaret Mead said almost exactly the same thing. The destruction of things that are familiar and important causes great anxiety in people. Economic development and environmental quality aside, what we're often trying to preserve is memory, an attempt to keep a mental image of familiar and accustomed places that make us feel comfortable and secure. The justification for preserving the special places of any community have as much to do with our need for psychological stability and cultural continuity as they have to do with beauty, ecology, or economics. Our communities can grow without destroying the things that people love. The landscapes of our states and regions, the countryside, the cities and the small towns are worth preserving not just because they're fragile and beautiful and rich in cultural and natural resources, but because they help us define who we are as a nation. All right, so finish the video as uh, any questions or comments any commissioners would like to make related to the video before we move on to our next item. Yeah, I, I would. I, I have seen that a couple times. Um, I find it ironic that we see it after such a short time since the state of California came in and told us that we will have a overgrown housing development on three acres um, yet here we're talking about how locals can take control so I just thought that that was kind of interesting any other comments anyone would like to make or can we move on all right I will move on to item number 10, our public hearings. We have one public hearing tonight, uh, conditional use permit CUP 22-02. And uh, Ms. Hunter, could you please provide the staff report? Of course. Um, so conditional use permit 22-02 is a request from the applicant, Coldwell Banker Realty, to modify the existing pole sign adjacent to 601 Main Street and located wholly within city property, the Ivy House lot. Uh, no permits or approvals exist for the pole sign. However, installation of the sign would have predated the current sign ordinance adopted May 2002. Therefore, staff has determined that the sign is a non-conforming use. The proposed modification would include replacing the topmost building identification sign with a similarly sized Coldwell Banker tenant sign and placing a smaller building identification sign below the existing blue ribbon tenant sign. The proposed modifications are shown in figure four of the staff report and behind you on the wall to whoop, the right, the farthest uh, to the right. Uh, the proposed sign would maintain the same height and slightly reduce the overall width of the sign. Uh, new signage is within the allowable aggregate square footage for signs permitted under Placible Zoning Ordinance 10-4-17, which is a total of 120 square feet based on the 60-foot frontage. 
Uh, staff's opinion is that the placement of a large tenant sign at the top of the structure provides dominant advertising to Coldwell Wheeler Banker Realty over the building identification and its address as a whole. Further, staff recommends that the topmost sign should remain the identification for the professional building to be consistent with other professional business signage within the city. Of note, the placement of a smaller tenant sign for Coldwell Banker Realty below the existing blue ribbon sign fitting within the pole sign frame is permissible by right and under the non-conforming use as a replacement of copy, although the change is a modification of the sign design. Therefore, staff recommends Planning Commission take the following action. Uh, one, adopt the staff report as part of the public record. Two, deny or modify the request for a CUP for the proposed modification to the existing Ivy House Professional Building pull sign. And three, make the following findings. A, the request is exempt from CEQA per section 15301, exempting projects including replacement of new copy on an existing sign. And B, that the request is consistent and in harmony with the general plan as it will provide adequate provisions for business identification. And four, if modified, conditionally approve the request subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Great, thank you. Are there uh, questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner Keeney? I have some questions. Uh, actually, my first question is, uh, uh, this is all involves the signage. So why are we just looking at a conditional use permit and not also a site plan review? If the proposed modification was basically a change in tenant and copy, uh, staff would not have brought this issue to you. So basically, um, as a pole sign uh, that exceeds 10, it, it's, it's uh, defined as a pole sign under our uh, sign ordinance in the zoning ordinance. So any, any uh, sign, because um, it's, its form is more of a monument sign, but because it's 10 feet, uh, it's greater than 10 feet, it triggers a conditional use permit. Typically, a sign, if this were a new sign, not only would it be a conditional use permit, but it would be a variance request because the applicant would have to make or demonstrate the necessity to have a sign over 10 feet. Uh, but we felt since it was an existing sign, it's been there, we believe, since probably the 1970s when the building was first built, uh, we have no we've found no permit or any information regarding how the sign was permitted on the site. Uh, we deem it a uh, legal non-conforming use, but we are requiring a conditional use permit to bring it in conformity and have conditions of approval applicable to the sign. Also meaning that this sign is, is wholly within, within city property. We don't have, or at least we haven't been able to find an encroachment um, agreement for the sign. And so that would be just one of the conditions of approval we'd like to apply to this so that we have that. Uh, the sign being within the Ivy House uh, parking lot, uh, should the sign uh, become a conflict with the realignment of Clay Street and Cedar Ravine, and if, if the sign has to be removed, uh, it would be at the sole uh, expense of the owner to have that sign uh, removed or placed elsewhere. So back to your question about why we're not uh, providing for a site plan review. Uh, the sign in and of itself doesn't uh, trigger a site plan review in our opinion. Well, what about the use? Is there a real estate office in that uh, professional building right now? Yes, they moved in uh, earlier this year. Is it, is it Coldwell Banker? Is it's Coldwell Banker, there? yes. And uh, there's an existing tenant uh, blue, uh, blue ribbon. Blue ribbon. Yeah. There, th there was previously a real estate office in there. Is that? No, I believe it was a uh, an accounting um, office that was in there before. Mm -hmm. Right. And they vacated the building they vacated, and Caldwell and Banker so then moved the, in. Uh, employment services, blue ribbon, and then the vacant space. Um, so, Two using tenants. this as a, a real estate office is a new use for the building. Right. Yes, it is. And is is that a use by right? We consider it a use by right. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at the Caldwell Banker, when they moved in to the, they were the, they're the sole occupant of the building that's at Main Street and Spring Street. Uh, we required a conditional use permit as a uh, formula business. 
So that right, came this, before that, the commission, and that was back in 2019 before. when it went to Century 21. Is right. that the uh, Fairly example recently. you're talking about? Yes. Okay. And that was because they were going to paint the building. We wanted to look at the uh, the totality of any changes they were making to the site and to the building as a formula business. Uh, it would have required a conditional use permit and a site plan review. So you had the ability to regulate uh, the operation of the use, but it's office, so there's really not much to regulate. But the site plan review allowed the commission the ability to look at the, the aesthetics, the design, the color, the signage on that particular site. This is a little bit different, and this came about when I think it's, I think it's movement reality. It was a... And I may be wrong on the, the on the real estate firm that moved in there, but <clears throat> directly across the street we have a multi-tenant building, and we had a formula business move into that building. We did not require a conditional use permit or a site plan review for that, and that was upon discussion with our city attorney, mainly because really the only change was the sign, a change in copy. So they're not affecting any change in the entire building to advertise their business. And so in that case, we then waived their requirement to have a site plan review or a conditional use permit because it was just office uh, within a building that, that serves as office space. So we, look at, we looked at, we applied that same principle or the same set of circumstances to this building since it's a multi-tenant building. They're not changing any colors uh, to the building. It's only the signage. So we really focused on the signage. We had no permitting at all, and as I can mention before, typically would have been a conditional use permit and a variance for this type of sign if they came in as a new sign uh, based on its height. But we felt that uh, they're modifying the sign enough that we felt that it was actually modifying the design of the sign, not just copy. And so that's why staff felt that we wanted to bring that forward uh, to you, the Planning Commission, to make that decision. and. Hopefully you would support staff's recommendation that uh, the sign remain, We, it, it, and it's staff's opinion. I mean, the, the commission may feel different, but we feel it, it's an aesthetically pleasing sign. It clearly identifies the address and the building as being the Ivy House uh, professional building with and below it the, the advertisement for the tenants. And so that's why we come before you now with this item. Well, the um, Century 21 example that you uh, mentioned, yeah, that's what uh, triggered, triggered my concern with this application. We had a very extensive review for that. They, they changed their sign, and they did uh, change colors of the building, but uh, they already had their – it already existed as a real estate office. And uh, looking over the ordinance – uh, actually, looking over that example, uh, one of the findings that we made was that Century 21 was a formula business. And I've, I just want to make sure that we handle all the applicants that come to us the same. To my thinking, Coldwell Banker is also a formula business. And as I reviewed the codes, you know, we have a little more uh, strict standards of for formula businesses requiring site plan review. And so that's why I'm concerned that uh, we don't take this opportunity to do a, a more, I, I think it's more appropriate um, review looking at the site and also then considering the uh, conditional use permit, uh, which is, you know, exactly what we did for Century 21. So that's, that's my uh, concern with the application. Um, does anybody else have a comment or questions? I don't want to. When we looked at, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. When we looked at Century 21, it was a in a sense a change of ownership. It was the same the the, the same genre going in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I. So I had a CUP not, as a real estate office, and so that that continues that runs with the land, right? So. Right. But we did consider it and uh, along a CUP um, application as well as a site plan review at that time. Okay. I understand what you're saying, um, if I'm following correctly. That, but I, I 
would tend to agree, I think, with what you were saying, that the, the more extensive changes of the Century 21 triggered the more extensive re review, whereas this is just about the sign and we're just approving the sign. Whereas if they were changing, putting, for example, a huge sign on the side of the building or, or changing the, the overall look, I could uh, see what you're saying and I understand the, the thought path that you're going mm -hmm. down. The, my, my, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want us to be uh, sensitive to concerns about uh, particularly formula businesses mm -hmm. uh, issuing a conditional use permit uh, the way I when I looked at the zoning codes, it's, you know, that is something the Planning Commission is supposed to, you know, consider. And since a conditional use permit, you know, runs with the land, uh, you know, once it becomes a real estate office, it can, it can always stay a real estate office. Uh, you know, that's just the, the terms of a CUP. Uh, but I also want to be sure that we're treating all applicants the same, you know. And I, I realize that this is simply the change here is uh, occupying a space and, and using it as an office, but the, the sign is the major, is the only aesthetic change to, you know, mm -hmm. the passersby. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there other questions to staff? Well, because we don't have an applicant here, I, I will say looking at, um, we're given a page of examples um, of other signs throughout the community and without exception we we find the um, the name of the building at the top kind of like uh, you look for the title on a book <laughs> somewhere on the front is going to be the title of the book and and the author's name uh, under that uh, less important things um, in in teaching design you you taught the big I taught the big what's the big important thing and then those things that support that and in this case um, I, I think having the name Ivy House professional building at the top fits moving it to the bottom it I agree back to our back to yeah. our, our, our yeah. thing up here <laughs> exactly you know yeah. we're we're lessening a standard and I think that mm -hmm. we if we did that, we could have any one of these come back to us and say, hey, you did it for them. What about me? I want my name up there top. That's really more to the point of this application before us. Mm -hmm. I, I am concerned about the process, but when I looked uh, my first reading of the staff report, I agree completely. That is not um, the examples you showed of other existing. And the, the, the sign as it is um, needs some repair. Uh, I I looked at it, it needs yeah. to be painted, but mm -hmm. the examples that we have there and, and in the, the area are more with the, the title of the building and then the occupants are, are listed. And so that's uh, more consistent with uh, the aesthetics of the rest of the central business district, also more closely aligned with the goals uh, in our you know general plan I think that's stated very well in the staff report you know what what were uh, the guidelines were to look at so uh, you know I agree completely that that was actually my uh, first my biggest concern with this application is that uh, that it looks unbalanced it doesn't uh, seem in scale and it's not in keeping with other signage that we have um, nearby and and throughout the the uh, city. Uh, Commissioner Lepper? Yeah, I 100% agree with what you guys are saying um, aesthetically with this. But I do want to touch back on what Chris said about formula businesses. Are we putting ourselves at any risk by not discussing the fact that, it's, do we need to go over the fact that it's a formula business and approve that, just a simple approval of it even? Or is that irrelevant to, um, just because it's been such a hot topic and we've had a lot of discussions on it and, and um, even just like I said, if it's just a simple approval of a formula business going in, do we need to address that, or do you think that we're we're okay not addressing that? I think it would be staff's opinion that we're probably okay. I think there's a distinct difference between what kind of formula business we were referring to. I I recall when the formula business issue first arrived, mm -hmm. that was back when uh, the city was looking at the highway 50 offer or highway 50 operational improvements when that connection was going to be made um, linking Placerville Drive with Main Street lower Main Street in particular uh, um, uh, I think the city was concerned about having 
formula business, mainly fast food, moving into that area, and where fast food typically sometimes you see, you know, not only very large signage, but the entire building takes on it's a sign, <laughs> <laughs> like we saw in the example in, in 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 the program where it shows a McDonald's. You know, it used to be in McDonald's the entire building with the golden arches. The the entire building was what was the sign mm -hmm. where depending upon the community and its desire to have a the building more fit fit in with the um with with the um oh what's a good word for it just the type of architecture germane to that town that it's then just the sign that demonstrates what what the type of restaurant it is here we're talking about uh, a professional office use okay. And so the difference between the Century 21 is we had Century uh, Coldwell Banker moved out, Century 21 was moving in, or they're going to bring in their own signage, their own color, a lot of their own um, uh, architectural branding. That's mm -hmm. a good word, uh, branding. And so that's why we, we triggered the site plan review and conditional use permit for that particular use. It changed when we were looking at another formula, and it was a formula business only because it was, you know, greater than five stores, and that was a realty that moved in right across the street, a multi-tenant building. They weren't going to change anything except just the copy. And so in, in discussions with our city attorney, there's no reason to require a site plan review because we're not going to look at any changes to the building, a multi-tenant commercial building. Um, and uh, with a conditional use permit, there's no there's no conditions as far as the operation of an office establishment, and so we just applied uh, the same um, uh, concerns or not concerns, but the same approach to this one. It's really uh, if they we probably would not have we wouldn't be here if they were just going to change the copy and leave the sign as is. Mm -hmm. But because they wanted to modify the sign a little bit, which we felt was changing the overall design of the sign, not just copy, we wanted to bring that to the commission and then get a conditional use permit for the sign. Great. Thank you. Totally makes sense. Okay. okay. Yeah, I under, understand as well. I didn't have any um, questions for staff on this item, although I would say I sort of agree with what my fellow commissioners have said and that I think, you know, it's appropriate, particularly in the central business district, to keep the signage sort of consistent between buildings where the professional building name is listed at the top with the um, tenants underneath. And I also think it's sort of unfair to tenants in a building if one person gets their name at the top and the other tenants don't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think that's particularly fair to Blue Ribbon Professional Services in this case <laughs> um, if that change was to be um, approved. If, are there any further discussions, questions, comments, or a motion on this item? Just one quick one for staff. Um, thank you. Um, the address, is there a height minimum that that must be on the street? Um, they have the, the 601 Main Street way up top. Could it be brought down to the bottom? And the, and the two tenants moved up. It, you see what I'm saying? That it, it, is there an ordinance that says it has to be? I, I, I haven't found anything, but. Uh. Uh, the city does not have an ordinance regar requ um, regarding addressing. <clears throat> we are going to look at doing that uh, because it's something that we do lack. I know the El Dorado Fire Protection District has regulations on the size of the address, the location of the address, and so we could add a condition or something, or we, we, we can just require them to comply with that, kind of separate from this. But, but you raise a good point. It is on staff's list of things to do is to actually develop an addressing list uh, ordinance uh, on, on how we address buildings and such because we see a lot of hot spots. You see a situation where you'll see a numerical ad uh, a number of numerical addresses for a single structure where you have different numbers for different stories. You shouldn't do that. So we're trying to slowly change that. But that's a good point. That might be a suggestion to the, to the Cold War banker to 
spruce up the sign by moving the address to the bottom and moving blue ribbon up and theirs would be a little higher up and that if that were to occur that would be addressed through a ministerial process correct or would that be something that would need to come to the Planning Commission no I think that was something that we would work through the fire district the fire district can okay. can impose better you know where that address goes in that building okay I think too um, in this situation with the landscaping as it is which I know discusses cleaning up some of the landscape which I think would help Coldwell Banker if they put their um, sign on the bottom clean up some of that landscape so you can see it clearly um, I think maybe on this case the address is a little more visible at the top um, as it is and just adding Coldwell Banker on the bottom um, would be sufficient I had written down to clean up the landscape refresh the paint and add Caldwell Blanker to the bottom as my comments for for approval um, in addition to your conditions of approval I guess at that point would we need we would deny the permit though right because they would no longer need a conditional use permit if they put their signage at the bottom is that correct I think staff's recommendation would be to we staff would like to have a conditional use permit for the sign which doesn't exist so I think this is an opportunity to do that so I would recommend then that you uh, that basically what you would be doing is modifying the the, the request as, as provided by the applicant and then okay. you would just state that you would retain the building identification address it, at the top is currently as it currently is on the existing sign and then uh, the Coldwell banker would then um, have a spot below as one of the tenants either whether it's above or below uh, yeah. the other tenant is up to them them yeah so I uh, want to make sure we're clear are you looking for a direction from the Planning Commission I, I'm looking at the uh, recommended uh, action on page 10 uh, under 4b applicant to submit a revised sign elevation subject to approval by staff so um, are you looking for direction from the Planning Commission to specify things like the location of the address or um, is it sufficient that uh, w you know we uh, could let's see approve the request pending staff's approval of the modified sign that would then incorporate the concerns that we've expressed or or do we need to specify in our findings that you know the the location of Coldwell Banker the lo location of the street address I just want to make sure that when we do make a motion it's what you need uh, what you're looking for from us yes I think staff would like to have a motion where the building identification and address remain at the top of the sign as as it as it currently stands and that then the Caldwell banker would then be moved and, to and you want us to specify spot. that in our findings that yeah, that's it, uh, following those kinds of yes. uh, guidelines uh, yes. okay I just want to make sure I'm, yeah, I'm clear on what then you that's need a from CUP us. for that poll sign so in the future we're not going to worry about somebody trying to take that off without modifying the conditional use permit it's like a typical ladder sign and you would you'd have the tenants below however they're arranged however they decide to arrange them but but the overall design of the sign then remains consistent with how it is today mm -hmm. does Coldwell Banker have the option to say I want blue ribbon on the bottom is that their that decision? would be I think that's between them okay got it between the two tenants because it yeah I would prefer I think since the blue ribbon's been there longer and that they should just stay where they are and put Coldwell below and does <laughs> yeah, that make sense or is yeah, that not up to us that's copy I don't think got you I don't think staff gets involved as, okay. as to the where placement. tenants yeah. go on a particular ladder sign cool. I don't know who's leasing the most space in true. that building that's, that's probably true. the one that gets the greater <laughs> spot yeah <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into it if we don't have to I was just wondering if we yeah. needed to specify that yeah. okay Discussions, questions. Anybody? I'm trying to make sure to that make a uh, we, <laughs> I, I am thinking of uh, adding to 4B. Uh, it says applicant to submit revised sign elevation subject to approval by staff, but then adding uh, something like 
revised sign elevation shall have building name at top, street out address second, and tenants listed uh, below. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. That seems that sounds appropriate good. Sounds good. to me. Okay. I just want to make sure I've captured. Yeah. Staff is nodding. You know what we, <laughs> what we think, and give staff that way they don't have to come back. Yeah. You know with yeah. mm -hmm. another um, package to us. All right. Anything else? I think that captured it really nicely. Can I yeah. Chair, yes. Uh, I would. I would like to make a motion. Right? <laughs> I think this is always a hard part. <laughs> uh, based on our discussion, uh, I'd like that uh, we follow the uh, staff recommendation recommendations given uh, in the staff report, uh, starting on page ten, that uh, we adopt the staff report as part of the public record. Um, we approve the uh, request uh, for the conditional use permit uh, based on uh, the subsequent or following findings uh, under section three that th this request is exempt from CEQA uh, the request the request as it stands is not in harmony with the general plan um, no the request as modified uh -huh. below yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is in harmony with the general plan as it will provide adequate provisions for business identification then uh, under four, we do approve the request as modified subject to the following conditions. Approve CUP 22-02, allowing for the specified height and square uh, footage at 601 Main Street. B, applicant to submit a revised sign elevation subject to approval by staff, modifying that to read, the revised sign elevation shall have building name at top, street address given second, then tenants listed below staff can approve mm -hmm. uh, the own owner shall obtain an encroachment agreement with the city of Placerville subject to the approval of the city engineer and um, no change to D and that is the my motion I second all right we have a first and a second uh, any further discussion or are you ready to vote any uh, did you catch all of that? I'm, yeah. I'm any trying to read my <laughs> quick <beautiful>. handwriting. <laughs> yeah. okay. Any comments by staff or clarification <laughs> needed before? <laughs> we're good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're good. Thanks. Okay. Good. Uh, could I get a roll call vote? Okay. Um, Chair Gopper. Aye. Commissioner Keeney. Aye. Commissioner Lepper. Aye. Commissioner List. Aye. All right. So we are now uh, done with item number 10.1. Uh, we have no continued items tonight and no new business. So we are going to move on to item number 13.1, staff reports. Does staff have anything they would like to report to the commission tonight? Uh, staff would like to give a brief report on the Mallard and Middletown affordable housing projects. We have been hoping uh, to get uh, tax credits for that project and we have uh, been unable to do so. Uh, tax credits are reviewed and approved by the U.S. Department of the Treasury and they have a certain algorithm that ranks a project's location and it scores it based on certain resources depending upon where it's located. Usually it's the more urbanized areas that score high and so unfortunately possibly being a smaller area uh, the project was not scoring very high and was not getting the tax credits after I think three or four different attempts. Uh, the state of California created a new funding source called the Accelerator Program uh, that um, a project may make application for uh, in lieu of the tax credits and lo and behold uh, both the Mallard and Middletown successfully uh, received uh, grant funding through the accelerator program so it looks like uh, these projects are moving forward they will move forward at a quick pace uh, the city is making an application uh, for through the R RCAC for a short what's called a short-term bridge loan uh, the project has already received community development block grant funding uh, for land acquisition in the amount of one and a half million dollars and that's collectively for both projects and so because the CDBG monies 
uh, must be expended first uh, uh, before the city would get reimbursed, um, uh, we have that gap that will maybe be anywhere from just a few weeks to a month to close escrow. And so uh, we're going to the council uh, next Tuesday to get approval then to get this short-term loan. And once that happens, uh, we should be able to close escrow, and then the community development block grant funds through HCD will come through, and then they're going to go right into the phase of development of um, uh, construction drawings and architectural drawings and um, doing the site plan and grading permit. So we're pretty excited. It looks like those two projects will move forward. So I just wanted to report that to you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, great. great to hear, yes. Um, um, back to uh, commission members. Uh, do any commission members have questions or comments that they would like to make? All right, I see none. So we will move on to adjournment. So it is 7.05 on Tuesday, September 6, 2022, and I am now adjourning the City of Placerville Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. Thank you.